Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Sorens. I'm a senior software engineer at Chef Software. And in this short um, time slot, I hope to give you, guide you safely through a coding maelstrom with OPA at the center of that storm. It's a hodgepodge of exposition, tutorial, and tips, but they work together to paint a picture of how my uh, I found an authorization system with OPA at its core could be put together. My teammates and I work full time in auth, but ambidextrously, by which I mean full stack rather than just the typical back end, which makes it, I think, a lot more fun. That and the fact that Chef is all open source lets me present this talk without having to be hand wavy, really, at any point. Not an advertisement, but I'm going to talk about the DevOps dashboard that uh, we make at Chef called Chef Automate. And mainly because uh, I think that having context makes it a lot easier to digest what will follow. Okay, this is the blurb from our website as to what Chef Automate actually is. Um, the notion of coded enterprise, I'll just mention briefly, it's our notion that uh, enterprises, to be competitive in today's world, you have to express not only infrastructure as code, but also security policies and application dependencies as code. Okay, so Automate provides uh, lots of analytics for managing huge numbers of nodes, which are machines, VMs, containers, what have you. Okay, this is one screen from many uh, of that available. And ultimately, what it's used for is analytics. But you know, at the end of the day, there's the folks that do all that you know, valuable stuff for the customers, and then there's us who do the identity and access management uh, policy, which is, of course, the more interesting stuff to me at this point. Okay. So, um, under the settings tab here is where we tuck away all our, our IAM stuff, and that's this cluster down here that you see. And those are the interesting bits that we use for authorization and pre-authorization. And I'll talk about what those mean in just a little bit here. So ultimately, this is the story of a button, but not that button, this button. Okay. So um, I'm logged in here, you'll notice, as the administrator. So administrator as typical can do pretty much whatever they want but I'm going to uh, log out in my slides here and log back in as a typical user I volunteered Torin for this exercise unbeknownst to him so notice that the top menu bar is now severely curtailed compared to this last slide over here and even the the main screen is not accessible to a user out of the box okay so the game plan what I'm going to do is uh, show you what it takes to materialize that uh, button for our non-admin user, and then we'll return to the story of the button itself. Okay. See if my little video is going to work here. Okay, at the top of the screen is uh, the browser with an, our non-admin user, and at the bottom is a uh, command line where I will be showing some commands to help out our user. Uh, first, I'm going to add our user to the viewer's team. And default policy is allow viewers to see most pages across the application except for the IAM resources. So that gives just minimal access to settings. So we, we have the settings available now here. Actually, let me see if my pointer is working OK. So we have just a couple uh, guys available under settings, uh, but not teams yet. Okay. Oops, sorry. OK, so I'm now going to uh, create this policy in a JSON file that gives some um, permissions for a user to access Teams. There's a, a Teams get, you'll see, Teams list. Uh, the, the projects was the one that was already there kind of by default. And I'm going to feed this JSON on the uh, command line to enable this policy for our user. Once that's done, if we go back to settings now, a second time. Okay, now you'll see Teams shows up over here. And when I click on Teams, now we get our list of Teams. But notice there's no button yet. Okay, so I'm going to go back into the policy here and add a Teams create. And then we need to feed that back into the system as, as an updated policy. So you see Teams Create showing up down there now. And if we come back again to the Teams page this time, now we've got our Create Team button. So we're going to talk a lot about, about what 
uh, is involved in that. OK, so what happens when we press that button? A request goes from the browser to the back end. There we have an interceptor in our gateway that determines authorization. And if authorized, the request is allowed to proceed. Authorization is a query, as Tim was talking about, for a given user. Uh, is a specific action allowed on a particular resource? Okay. Here is in, in a sequence diagram, just a little more detail. So over here, our actor is uh, has the the user and teams is what we're, we're grouping together as subjects, plus the action and the resource that goes into the gateway, makes what we're calling an is authorized request. All of that is handled by our AuthZ service over here. And the OC service talks to the OPA engine uh, with the uh, is authorized query at that level, and that comes back with our basic allow or deny decision. Okay, that percolates back to our gateway, and at that point, the gateway either, if it's authorized, it will pass through the original request with its parameters and then send its result back, or it can just send the deny um, if there was no authorization there present. Okay, how that query comes together. Okay, the, the front end is going to uh, execute an HTTP request that you see at the top there, which is the, the method and the URL. And the URL is mapped. Okay. So via our protobuf files, uh, the URL is, is here, and from there we can extract from the annotations the resource and actions. Okay. Separately, the uh, user context from the HTTP request itself has the subjects in it. So from there we get the subjects. So that gives us the three things we need to make our authorization query the subject action resources. That goes through our OPA uh, library calls and comes back with our allow deny decision. Okay, so what are, is the query actually querying? Okay. So um, AuthC is uh, attempting to match the subject action resource of the query against a policy with the similar fields. So you'll see the query we was just talking about on the right here with a given subject action resource. The policies look very similar, and this is one that would match that, so that's why you see the, the same terms kind of in there. But the subject matches, the action matches because of the use of a wildcard over here. So any, any action field would match that wildcard. Similarly, a resource, we're going to have kind of a nested structure, and since there's a wildcard on the end there, that would tend to match whatever is here. Okay. And then the effect here, it can be allow or deny. This is an allow. So that's why this type of query would um, generate access if this policy was in the system. Okay. By the way, I should mention, you know, I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions. I'd uh, probably keep them at the end because time is short. And you'll notice I'm talking very fast also because I timed these slides. And I'm going to be pretty tight so far, but I'll keep going here. OK. So. Um, our domain terminology, this is how it maps to OPA terminology. Okay? Uh, I've been talking about our query. That's uh, what you feed to OPA as an input. Our policy definitions are OPA data, and our regio code are OPA policies. Unfortunately, we have the overlap in, in the term policy there. It means totally different things, but there's kind of no way around that. Uh, just to give it a little more uh, life cycle perspective, the query is unique per invocation. You know, whatever we're asking permission for, it has whatever its parameters are. Our policy definitions, which is the open data again, those are customer modifiable, but changes are fairly infrequent. Um, that's something that uh, typically a customer will do um, while they're setting up, defining things initially. It's, it's more of a configuration kind of thing, so changes are infrequent. And that is uh, significant when considering performance in particular. To make our is authorized request fast, we pre-process the open data to partially evaluate the query at the time we feed it the policies or the, the open data, if you prefer. Okay. And that trade-off has a cost, though. So it gives us a, a much faster is authorized query at, as we're querying you know, during regular use of the system. But that setup time is slower to handle the data update. But again, since changes are infrequent there, that, that trade-off is well worth it to us. Okay. So what's behind the curtain in terms of rego? Okay. Before I answer that, uh, show of hands, how many of you practice TDD occasionally, test-driven development? OK, we've got some there. And how many of you have actually used TDD for Rego? Anybody? A ah, couple. Oh, cool. OK. Um, I'm just going to give a, a, a brief uh, little tip on that, so that's cool. OK. Um, so did you know that OPA does unit tests? Okay. Uh, um, 
When I'm designing code, I tend to think in terms of system requirements or code contracts expressed as unit tests, even, even when I'm dealing with OPA. Besides the very helpful benefit of TDD, you know when you're done, because when your test passes, you're done, essentially. TDD makes writing OPA easier, so let me give you a glimpse here. This is our first requirement, that authorization is denied by default. Okay? So I'm gonna make my first unit test. And I'm going to uh, assert that I, the authorized will default to false by simply saying, uh, throwing the not in front of our authorized policy. No inputs, no data, just very simple here. And the implementation is just giving a constant, so that test will pass. Okay. Next requirement. Okay. Here I'm saying that deny will supersede allow in all cases. Okay. So just like conventional unit tests, I'm feeding in um, parameters to see the rules or policies under test. I'm saying deny is gonna be true and allow is gonna be true, what'll happen there. Okay. So the implementation is simple. I'm saying that I need allow to be true and I need deny to be false, okay? In this case, remember that I said deny is being passed in as true, so it's not gonna pass, therefore, that's why I have the not in front here to make the test pass, okay? Um, just a couple tips here and there, so with uh, a single rule, all the expressions in a rule have to be true, so I need the allow to be true and I need the deny to be false. Both of those have to be true in order to get authorized to be true. So let's run that, and I've run my OP unit test both from the command line, but probably more frequently in VS Code itself. So uh, did you know that, v that uh, VS Code actually runs OP unit tests? What's cool is um, today, you know, most folks know about continuous integration, continuous development, but for developers, you're really missing out if you've not tried continuous testing, which is test via evaluation as you're actually typing your code. Uh, a couple of great tools for this um, in Visual Studio. There's NCrunch in VS Code. There's a, a tool called Wallaby that's good for TypeScript. And the OPA plugin for VS Code is almost continuous testing. You actually you have to hit a keystroke to activate it, but it makes it uh, remarkably fast to do a think, edit, test kind of cycle. Okay, let's fast forward a bit. Um, I've fleshed out the allow and deny policies there a little bit. So our allow policy is saying, does there exist a policy whose effect is allow and whose subject, action, and resource will match the input? You don't actually see the input here because they're in lower level calls, but uh, what you do see here is this policy ID variable that binds them all to talk about the same policy. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, uh, I'm going to first talk about uh, the has action uh, rule here that goes a little bit lower level. So this is going to yield, because of the uh, what I call the indexing notation, uh, it's going to yield a set rather than just a true or false. Okay? And I have here a action matches function that we're calling, and that function is defined incrementally in two pieces here. Okay? So action matches will be uh, valid if either of these matches. Okay, so just looking at the two here. The first one is saying if the input exactly matches what was in the data, then we're good. The second one is saying ignore the input completely. If we have that wild card that I showed you earlier, then it doesn't matter what the input is, we've got a match there, okay? All right, um, so let's rewind to our example. Uh, we have, the, again, the query on the right-hand side there and the policy on the left, and in lingua opa, that's you know, our input versus data. Okay? So the action matches, in this case, is going to um, return true because the stored uh, value in the policy or in the data is the asterisk. So it doesn't matter that we had right here. Anything will do, so that gives us a match. Okay? So therefore, this guy matched, this guy did not match, but you only need one of them, so action matches here is good. So we're going to take the policy ID that that matched on and return that from has action. Okay? So we're halfway there already because that uh, data uh, had an effect equals allow, now we've got has action is good, that has found a policy. We wanna see if has resource and has subject, has subject match on the same policy. Okay, a resource is, uh, in our system is very much like an action, except you can have multiple terms, like the examples you see um, right there. Uh, the other just notable thing here is we have these put in a separate common package because this resource matches actually needed to be used in a couple different places. So you can, you can actually uh, compartmentalize and 
uh, separate your code in packages in that way as well. Okay. So here, looking again at our data and our input, the resource uh, has a compliance nodes foo versus the data having compliance nodes wildcard. So that, again, will be a match for us there. OK. Finally, subjects. Subjects adds a, a, another characteristic to this. Subjects as a list rather than a singleton. Uh, both the input can be a list of subjects and the data can be a list of subjects. So this is going to assert that we have some subject in some policy that matches some subject in the input. Okay. In this case, it's trivially true because the subjects is a singleton array in both cases and they're the same value, so that gives us a pass. Okay. Winding that back to our unit test now to put it uh, together. Here I'm showing a uh, single policy that has an array of subjects. One of those subjects is what we fit in our input, so that's going to match. The action resource, those are the A and R, those match. So this unit test will pass for us. This um, with clause that you get when you're doing unit test is a very cool little feature, by the way. Uh, lets you feed in arbitrary JSON, and you can have more than one policy here. I only needed one as an example, but you, you, you can put more in here. You can make things as arbitrarily complex as you want. This is, in fact, the very same unit test, even though it looks different. Um, you can use dot notation or JSON notation as you please, or both mixed together. So here I'm saying I have the, uh, the policies with a policy ID, with its subjects as these guys, and if I back up one, that's the same thing that we did here. We, we started with the same prefix, but then switched over to JSON. There's the subjects with those same guys. So you have a lot of flexibility as you are uh, writing out unit tests, just depending on your style or your team style. OK, just a minute here. Should make sure I'm not missing any things as I'm going. OK. All right. So. Um, I encourage you to think of RegioCode like any other code. Not only do unit tests help ensure that you don't later introduce bugs inadvertently, but they also help when developing your code, especially when combined with TDD. So that's essentially the end of that section, except what I've been talking about is our IAM version 1. Um, our IAM v2 is now in beta, which adds another dimension, uh, which is projects. And a project, um, in, our, in our context, lets you reduce the scope of permissions on resources that could be business units, departments, you know, what have you. Um, it could be based on um, different customers that you need to deal with. But it gives you the segmentation. It gives you a, a lot more expressibility uh, with what you can do with the system and, and makes it a, a lot more real for, for our customer base, Chef's customer base. We've, we've had customers that have been uh, very much clamoring for that type of thing. OK, so in action. You'll see this uh, project drop down up here. So I've checked off that, uh, the Pollux project. So now instead of either having permissions to see all teams or permissions to see no teams, I can have permissions to see teams on particular projects. So I get a, a short list here instead of a longer list kind of thing. So it, it, it gives a lot more practicality to the system. In terms of the sequence diagram, it um, looks similar but, but quite a bit different because now we are sending in a list of requested projects along with the subject action resource that you saw before. And now instead of an is authorized, which was giving us a Boolean, we're sending in a request for, called projects authorized. Okay. That goes from our gateway to our Auth-Z service. I should use a laser pointer there. Okay. And the Auth-Z service is going to send that uh, similar query over to our OPA engine. And that will come back from OPA with a list of allowed projects. That percolates back. And as long as we have at least one allowed project, then we pass through the original quest with those uh, allowed projects. And that now goes to whatever other chef service needs to process that. So they need to have awareness in the service now um, of the different projects and filter results based on that. That data then gets sent back as filtered data to the uh, user's browser. And if there were no projects at all allowed, then we would just get a don deny, and you don't get uh, a list of anything, for example. OK, that is the end of that section, really. OK, okay um, how are we doing on time here? OK, authorization in action. Uh, by itself, um, early on, it started out, we had pages that looked like this. You get um, ugly banners or things uh, that didn't come across as terribly user-friendly. And the technical term for that is either UG or U, depending on what part of the country you're from, I guess. 
So what if we could know in advance what was allowed and what was not allowed? Okay. We call this pre-authorization or introspection on that. So uh, we're going to talk about this um, for the last uh, section here, and then we can get to questions if, if there are any there. So again, looking at our Teams page here, a, a fraction of that with the Create Team button, Behind this, uh, we use uh, the Angular framework. I'm going to talk about uh, Angular and such, but don't get too hung up in particular details if you don't know Angular or other things I'm talking about. It's uh, really trying to convey more kind of the concepts and how things fit together here, which I, I hope can paint a reasonable picture for you. Okay. Um, so once we had authorization, the next bit was obvious and sorely needed to provide a great user experience. So I'm going to start at the surface show you what the user sees, and dive down as far as we can go. Okay. So um, it's turtles all the way down, as they say. So here's at our top level. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, starting with Angular and go through the whole system down to OPA and, and see how these different pieces put together. Uh, this button itself is rendered by this guy here, the chef button. Okay? And there's the text you see on the button right there, the create team name. Now, um, chef button itself is just a customized component that does some of the styling and, and uh, kind of user characteristics. So I'm not going to bother about that. The interesting part here is the wrapper around that chef button, which is the app authorized, which is another custom component uh, that we've done. Okay. Um, notice that it uses this um, all of uh, input here, and what I'm sending it is, in this case, just a single um, HTTP endpoint and method, so we're doing a post on this particular method. You can send, uh, the reason it's an all of is because you can provide more than one um, HTTP method if you like. And my example is over, let's see, on this page. So for example, this um, group header access management only shows up if the user has permissions for policies or for roles or for projects. So. Uh, that's where you would actually use not an all of, but an any of. So if any of those were true, this group header would appear. Okay, so back to where we are. So there's three possible inputs, the any of or all of that I just talked about, or you can negate those uh, with the not clause. Okay, so you're seeing those inputs here in TypeScript in, uh, code, the all of input and the not. And this comp custom component is going to process those values that are fit in. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's going to determine whether this visible property is true or false. And that visible property is used here in the template. This is one line of um, essentially HTML that is injected into the Angular template. And this NGF con construct says that if visible is true, show the contents of whatever is inside here. Just back up here on screen. So in this case, that contents is this chef button guy. Okay. It can be arbitrary HTML, it can be a table, it can be a, a, just a piece of text, whatever you want there. Okay. So if visible is true, it will render that contents. So that's how a button can appear if you have permission for it or not appear if you don't have permission for it. Okay. Going down a little bit further, that it, uh, app authorized component is going to uh, dispatch this set permissions call with the all of and any of values that were given to it and then it will wait for the response to come back sometime later because it's talking to our backend at that point. So it's monitoring this all perms piece of state and as long as there's nothing coming back, this filter here is going to say, well, don't bother doing anything. Once we get some data that came back, then we're gonna go on to step three here, which is evaluate the original arguments we gave we gave against the permission set that all came back, and finally set that visible property that I just mentioned. And if, if we had the not, it'll be the, the inverse of it. Notice the exclamation point here for not. Otherwise, it'll just be the value we just calculated there. So very quickly, that's sort of how it puts those pieces together. Okay, okay so that um, state management I was talking about is um, a s substructure in Angular called NGRX that does state tracing. And it's, it's just a library. Uh, there's a, and there's a browser extension to um, 
dev tools that let you monitor that state without even having to instrument your code. So here, for example, is the dispatch that I talked about. It dispatches this get all permissions call, and sometime later, while other things are still going on, it'll get back from the back end the get all success call, and that has all of this data. So for each of the HTTP endpoints, it has uh, whether they have permission on each particular method, get, put, post, et cetera, et cetera. So I just zoom in a little bit here. There's showing we have get is true, post is true for this particular team's endpoint. Okay. <clears throat> so inside the NGRX mechanism is uh, the, the actual backend calls. So again, look, this is looking in the browser. We see the call to introspect endpoint. That via our protobuf uh, definitions is mapped to our introspect all um, request in our gateway handler. And okay, that uh, at this point, I'm just showing pseudocode basically for brevity, but it's all Go code from this point down. So uh, our gateway talks to our Aussie service, which is Go, and that uh, talks to uh, OPA via the Go interface. So just like our authorization that I showed you in the first part, our pre-authorization or introspection is making use of the subject section resources, but in this case, I'm generating the whole map of resource action pairs for all of the registered HTTP endpoints. Okay, we have these, the user's info and user's teams again, just like before, so we send those along uh, with the resource action map to our Authy service. It comes back here, and we generate an introspect uh, response with that map of endpoints, and that goes back to the front end, which we'll get back to in just a moment. Okay, so that goes through our load balancer, through our gateway, again to our OSC service, since that is what talks to our OPA. And the subject action resource comes in. In this case, uh, for introspection, we're getting this uh, whole map of um, subject and action pairs rather than just a single allow or denied kind of thing. Okay, just looking at the regio code side by side, the authorization, this was from the first part of the talk, showing that uh, these rules for allow and for deny, authorized, again, return just a single uh, true or false, essentially, as a result, based on those. The introspection code looks remarkably similar, but it's indexed, so it's returning pairs rather than just a true or false. Uh, but the, the top level structure here is almost identical, you'll, no, you'll notice. We're looking for actions, we're looking for resources, we're looking for subjects. And it's just dealing with those the pairs of things rather than just a single policy on there. But uh, lower level, there's a lot more going on. But basically, it's, it's kind of uh, cool that you know, the structure is, is very much the same there. Okay, so the, the TLDR of introspection. Um, we're taking uh, from the front end the HTTP endpoints. Those uh, are mapped via protobufs to find out uh, the action resource. Those go through our OSC system and comes back with this map of endpoints. So for the uh, given URL, these are the HTTP methods with the various trues and falses. Okay. And that is exactly what was needed back here in our front end HTML uh, template. We have the same uh, URL and uh, HTTP methods there, and that determines whether the, in this case, create team button gets rendered or not rendered. Okay, that is basically it. Um, this will be in my slide deck that uh, I assume will be available to you guys all. Last thing I'll just mention, don't forget to get your OPA t-shirt available only in Oregon because of that. That's how you make one. <laughs> so that is it. Thank you. So, questions? Any questions? Let's try to use a mic for the recording. Thank you for the presentation. The, the resources in your case were endpoints, not the individual identifiers of those resources, for example, right? Server ID and stuff like that. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. The resources in your case were URL endpoints. It was not going further down to the individual resource identifiers, like node ID and stuff like that, was it? No, no, it was not. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Um, how do you keep the um, pre-authorization decisions out of a decision log? Out of the what, I'm saying? Uh, if, you, if you ran a decision log in OPA, how do you keep the pre-authorization policy evaluations out of that decision log? Or do you log those as well? Um, actually, we're still kind of um, formalizing what we are logging or not. Um, we, we don't have a, um, I guess I'll call it a regimented uh, system as to what gets logged, but uh, right now um, the pre-authorization calls are not getting uh, logged in the system. We just have kind of general information so it, it keeps user data secure. Two parts to this question. First is, uh, is this for an internal application or a, a external application? This is external. Yeah, this, external. this is uh, our product called Chef Automate. That's a dashboard for pretty much uh, everything Chef does. Okay, got it. And do you see the need to run the checks that you have shown, authorization checks, were in band? Do you have a requirement to do out of band checks, like randomly checking whether the the, the policy that you have defined is all good? From time to time, do you run that periodically? Um, out of band in what sense? Not out of band is not when a request comes in, but uh, just a random check on the policy without any request coming in. Um, to kind of validate their integrity, you say? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, we don't. Else? Okay, well, maybe I've got one. Um, okay, here. Do you do active loading of cache data in OPA for your resources? Do you do any, any caching loading of data into OPA for your resource types and stuff? We do. That's, that's kind of what I was mentioning about um, when a user will uh, add, add or modify um, a chef policy, I guess I should call it, um, then we, we do essentially recompute um, and pre-evaluate stuff that is essentially caching that. So when we do our is authorized or project authorized query, that is, is much faster than without it, so yes. Okay, so it's, it's a push, it's, it's a bundle through the bundle API or? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. All right, I've got a quick one. Um, well, I don't know how quick it is. Okay, so uh, this is awesome. Like, it was great to see you uh, get up and give the talk and, and do the uh, sort of deep dive into how all that works. Uh, and I think you laid out a couple of the key challenges in this application use case, right? How do you allow end user admins to control the policies that are enforced for just their tenant? Um, how do you help the UI display the pieces that this user is actually authorized to see? How do you do backend authorization as well? Um, that's also a lot to, to do all at once. So do you have any advice about how you would roll this out and, and sort of get started putting uh, authorization in place using OPA for, for the application? Hmm. Great question. Um, I guess um, I would tend to start with um, you know, defining what you want to um, your policies to look like and experiment with them um, at, at the OPA level. Um, to me, kind of everything above that is, in a sense, window dressing that uh, e even in, in the back end as, as well as the front end, it's really just you know, sending the data back and forth. It's but uh, defining um, what you want your policies to, to be answering. What questions do they need to answer? In, in our case, it's a, a simple authorization, yes or no, originally, but then that morphed into, well, we need to, to bring projects in, so we're not gonna be doing just yes or no anymore. We need to um, come back with you know, a list of individual projects, so that uh, kind of reshapes the direction a little bit, but then it's, it's tweaking just how it's, how it's wired in. You know, I say just, but everyone knows that, that just is, is a very loaded term. All right, great. Let's thank Michael. Right. Thank you.